a GCSE computer science syllabus statement 1.4a show understanding of the need to keep data safe from accidental damage, hardware and software faults, and human errors. So, um, it's important that you, before watching any of the topic 1.4 or topic 1.5 videos, you need to watch security aspects from um, topic 2. Don't know why they put it there. They should have just put it here, honestly. But, uh, you know, you're going to have to watch that because it contains um, stuff like um, hacking viruses and spyware, which we're going to be using um, here as well. So it's good that you know about that. So once you've done that, we can continue with this. So let's start with accidental loss of data. So accidental loss of data is when you accidentally lose data. So an um, example could be if you're clearing out your um, computer to save some space, and then you accidentally delete a file, then um, which is important, then, uh, oh no. So here's some safeguards. First one, backup data in case of loss of corruption. This is um, an important um, one. In fact, this is um, a safeguard for each and every one of these points here. Um, and this is because, you know, I mean, backing up data is really important because um, you always have a spare copy if um, your file gets lost, corrupted, or whatever. Save data regularly. This is important because, um, say, you're working on a Word document or like, or yeah, some like you're working on something, um, and then you write two or three paragraphs, and then something happens, such as, um, like, I don't know, the, the power to your computer goes off, or, um, like, the, you know, the program crashes. Then you know you would have lost some of that data. So it's good that you save regularly to prevent this from happening. So um, for when I'm making these um, slides, I always save after the end of every sentence. Use passwords and user, ID, uh, user IDs to restrict access from unauthorized users. Now this is a bit weird because, you know, what does this have to do with accidental loss of data? Well, think about it. Like if you restrict access um, from people who um, don't know how to use a computer, then uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good so that they, they, there is less chance of them accidentally deleting the file. Um, yeah. Hardware faults safeguards. So a hardware fault um, is a fault in the hardware, such as um, like, like a head crash on a hard disk drive. Um, so it's important that you can save your data in case this happens. So um, again, backup data is good if you do that. Um, save data regularly, um, same point that we had last time. Um, also, you could use um, a UPS. Um, and what this is basically a power supply that's uninterruptible. So if um, the power goes off, you know, you you still keep your data because this power supply is still running. And use parallel computer systems as backup hardware. Um, so that's a good that's a good one because uh, you have two like parallel computer systems. So what you do with one computer system will also save in the other, um, or something like that. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's what it means. Um, so it's 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 good if you do that. Software faults, um, again, backup data, it's always there. Um, save data regularly. Um, so like if, if your software freezes or crashes or whatever when you're still working on that um, document, then it's good um, if you save because you know, there's no, no harm in saving. Incorrect computer operation safeguards. So incorrect computer operation could be stuff like um, you know like if you incorrectly shut down your computer for example or if you if you like remove your um, if you remove your thumb drive when it's well while data is being transmitted um, again backup is really important and um, go through correct training procedures to be aware of the correct operation of computers. Now this is a bit 
this is a bit weird because, uh, you know, I mean, who who doesn't really know how to use a computer? But still, like, it's good to know these um, principles so that you know, like, you, you basically, you know your stuff about computers. Um, so that's about it. Um, this is quite a short video. Um, but I'm just going to talk about security itself for a bit, um, as in the, the topic. So what we're going to be going through after this is we're going to be going through, um, I think it was firewalls, um, then security protocols, and what was that? Oh, whatever. Um, security protocols, um, encryption, and uh, some other, like, some attacks such as um, phishing and farming, as well as um, DOS, and also authentication. And then we um, we look at all this, and then we apply it to um, real life scenario, <laughs> like we did with um, input and output devices. So um, that's pretty much it. And then once we do that, we move on to um, topic 1.5, which wraps the entire um, theory of computer science up. So um, yeah, that's it. My GCSE computer science. This is a syllabus statement 1.4b, show understanding of the use of firewalls and proxy servers. So a firewall um, examines the traffic between the user's computer and the internet. And what we mean by the traffic is basically all the data that's sent. And uh, yeah. Um, it checks whether the incoming or outgoing data meets certain criteria. If the data fails to meet the criteria, the firewall will block the traffic and warn the user of a possible security issue. So yeah, the firewall kind of sits between the computer and the internet. Um, the firewall can also be, um, well, the firewall can be software or hardware. Um, and, and in fact, most computers, I think, have um, firewall on their computer. I mean, I know mine does, but I never use it. Um, logs all the incoming and outgoing traffic. Um, which enables the user to inspect it later on, to so inspect what's going in and coming out. Keeps a list of undesirable IP addresses, um, prevents access to certain websites. Now this is quite important because if there are any uh, suspicious websites, then Firewall can block those websites. Um, it also helps prevent viruses and hackers from entering the user's computer. Again, pretty important. Um, and also warns the user if software tries to access an external data source. So for example, um, like some software that you have um, upgrades itself automatically. So it says, oh, there's a new update available. The firewall um, can say, now hang on a second. Um, hey user, there's something going on here. Uh, do you want to let it, this happen or do you want to like, you know, deny this thing from happening, and the user can say, uh, you know what, I want this, I want this, uh, this is a good software, you know, uh, so I'll let it happen, or I could say, or the user can say, um, nah, I don't really, I don't really like this, uh, this is a bit weird, I, I don't remember installing this, uh, and the firewall can uh, do that. So, yeah, the firewall, in a nutshell, sort of like, it, it's used for warning user so I mean it's all down to the user like um, it doesn't really actually do much it just it's, it's like you can imagine it like a wall it just sits there and uh, can block certain things which the user can customize um, what to block what not to block and whatever um, yeah so um, there are certain circumstances where the firewall can't prevent um, harmful traffic. So, like, firewalls can't prevent people um, from using their modems to bypass the firewall. So, like, the firewall can't prevent them from doing that. Because, again, it's all down to the user. If they, like, you know, want to keep themselves secure, then they can do that with the firewall. If they don't, then the firewall ain't going to stop them. Firewalls aren't able to control employee misconduct or carelessness. So, be careful who you hire. Um, otherwise it could be screwed. Users can also disable their firewalls. So the firewall can't stop you from disabling um, it's, itself. Um, so 
This leaves their computers open to harmful traffic from the internet. So yeah, there's stuff that firewalls can't really do. Then there's the um, proxy server. So, um, basically, a, what a proxy server does is it acts as an intermediary. I, th I think that's how I, <laughs> I think that's how it's pronounced, um, which is sort of like a link um, between the user's computer and a web server. Um, proxy servers allow the internet traffic to be filtered, and the blocks access certain websites if needed. They can also speed up access to information from websites by using a cache, which is um, supplementary memory. So how this works is, um, it's like, you remember the buffer that we looked at? Um, so the uh, processor can store its data into a buffer, and the hardware can pick that data up from the buffer. Well, cache is a bit different. Um, this is, to, cache can be used um, to store, to, like, websites, um, so that when the user like visits the website the first time, yeah, it's going to be a bit slow. But the next time the user visits it, it's going to be like, yeah, it's, well, you know, we've, you've been here. Let's look at the cache. You've been here. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Speeds up access. If you know, you might notice this actually. Um, if you go to the website you've never visited before, it might take quite a while to load, and then you go to another website, and then another one, and then you can go back to that old website, and access will be faster. You may notice that. Um, you can go ahead and try it out. And they also keep the user's IP address a secret, which improves security. Um, so proxy servers act as a firewall, pretty much. So it filters internet traffic. So this is how both of them work. So here's the user's computer, and here's the firewall, and here's the internet. So data goes in, and then, yeah. So. That's pretty much how it works, and this filters what goes in and comes out. Good. Does that make sense? Comes in, goes out. That should be. I don't know why I say, I say comes out. It's a bit weird. Anyway, um, this is how proxy server works. Um, so I think we've looked at this actually. Um, topic two. We looked at a proxy server a bit. Um, so if you want to rewatch that video just to get a better understanding, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so here's the user's computer. So the request is sent um, when you're accessing a website. Request is sent, proxy server. Proxy server um, forwards this request to the web server. The web server responds um, to the proxy server, and the proxy server filters the response. So that's pretty much um, how they work. IGCSE Computer Science, Syllabus Statement 1.4c, Show Understanding of the Use of Security Protocols. As we go through these videos, I come to think to myself, you know, it's almost the end. Like, we're almost finished with the course. Like, right now we're, like, I think we're almost halfway through security. Um, I think it's just this video and then we're halfway through. That's it. But, yeah, I come to think of it. We've done, we've been through so much. So, yeah. Anyway, security protocols, right? We, we need to know about... Um, two security protocols. So we need to know about um, SSL and TLS. So let's start with SSL. So secure sockets layer is a type of protocol which allows um, data to be sent and received securely over the internet. So when a user um, logs into a website, SSL encrypts the data so that only the user's computer and the web server can understand what is being transmitted. Now I think that the next video is um, encryption. Now encryption is, um, well, we'll get to that in the next video. I was going to say something, but I decided to save it. So this is how, um, this is what happens. So the web browser attempts to connect to a website secured by um, SSL and asks the web server to identify itself. So it goes to the, uh, um, asks, uh, yeah, the web browser goes to the web server and says, who are you? So the web server sends the web browser a copy of its SSL certificate. So then um, it's just like, oh yeah, here's my here's my identity, here's my passport or whatever, here's my certificate. Web browser checks the certificate to see if it's trustworthy. Um, if it is, it sends a message back to the web server. It says, oh yeah, okay, you're legit, I can trust you. 
web server um, will send back a form of acknowledgement allowing the encrypted session to begin. And then he's just like, yeah, yeah, okay, if you're cool with that, then we can do this, we can do this, like we can do this thing, we can do this encryption, whatever. So the encrypted data is then shared securely between the web browser and the web server. Yay, happy days. TLS um, is another type of uh, security protocol. Now you may notice um, security protocol itself, that is. Um, you may notice um, when security protocol is applied, when, like you see on the, um, your browser, HTTPS, so HTTP secure. Um, do you remember that from Internet Principles of Operation? Um, it's, yeah. So you might also see a small padlock in the status bar. Um, so that's what um, that means. So, TLS. So it stands for Transport Layer Security. So it's another type of protocol, obviously. It ensures the security and privacy of data transmission over the internet. It's designed to provide encryption, authentication, and data integrity in a more effective way than SSL. So SSL is um, a little bit older. Um, it's TLS is a bit new in the world, so we'll also go through um, SSL versus TLS at the end, um, see what TLS also provides that SSL doesn't. So when a user communicates with a web server, TLS prevents third-party hacking. So TLS um, has two layers. There's the record protocol, which holds the data being transferred over the internet. It can be used with or without encryption. And there's the handshake protocol, which permits the website and um, user to authenticate each other and uh, use encryption algorithms. Um, so you'll know what encryption algorithms are in the next video. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, like, some web browsers support both SSL and TLS, um, which is why um, SSL is still used. There are some differences, however, to them. So for TLS, it is possible to add new authentication methods. That's a good thing. So you, like, you can extend um, TLS by doing that. TL TLS separates the handshaking process from the record, record protocol layer. Um, and also, TLS can make use of a process called session catching. So what session catching is, is, well, I'll put it this way. So when you open a TLS session, a lot of computer time um, is needed. And this is because um, of the large encryption keys being used. Um, and again, you'll, you'll know what encryption keys are soon. Um, so what, what happens is um, in session caching, Actually, did I say session caching before? I, I can't remember. Um, I, I don't know. Anyway, session caching. So, so careful, you say cache and not catch. Um, so what happens is you remember caches from uh, proxy servers. So what happens is um, it, can, it can cache each session to avoid um, the need to use so much computer time. So what happens is when it caches the session, you can resume the session um, later on instead of having to start a new one. So um, this boosts system performance. IGCSE Computer Science, Syllabus Statement 1.4D, Show Understanding of the Use of Encryption. All right, so we looked at encryption really briefly in the last video. So what is encryption? Well, encryption is used to protect data um, in case it gets hacked. And although it actually doesn't stop hacking, it can make the data meaningless to the hacker. There are two types of encryption. There's symmetric and asymmetric. Grr. Um, and yeah, we'll be looking at these two today. Um, and yeah. Now the thing I was going to say in the last video was, I was going to say asymmetric encryption is pretty hard to actually understand. Like, at, it, it took me a couple of hours to understand it um, fully before actually making this video. 
stayed up until like two making this, <laughs> like researching this and like, oh, what is this? What? How does this? All right. Um. So yeah. Um. What I've also done is for asymmetric encryption. We'll we'll look at the actual process and then we'll actually see this in a diagram as well, because I think the diagram helps to um, understand how it works. So we'll start with symmetric encryption. So symmetric encryption uses a secret key, which can be a combination of characters. Oh, uh, alliteration. Can be a combination of characters. This key can be applied to a message, which um, will make the message unreadable unless someone has the decryption key. One key is needed to encrypt the message, and another key, another one, is needed to decrypt the message. This means that the sender and receiver must have the same encryption and decryption key. Now, you may guess that this poses a problem. Because, I mean, like, in order for both sender and receiver to have the um, keys, like, they're going to have to send it to each other somehow. And what the hacker can do is intercept the sent key and uh, use it to decrypt the data. <laughs> that's, you know, that's not good, is it? But there is a way in which both the sender and receiver have the required key without having to send it. So here's how it works. So the sender uses an encryption algorithm and chooses a value. So um, x equals 2. And um, x is secret. Receiver um, uses the same encryption algorithm and chooses a value y equals 4. y is secret. So x is secret to the sender, y is secret to the receiver x is put into a sample algorithm. So 7 to the power of x mod 11. So it's 7 squared mod 11, which gives 5. And y is put into the same algorithm, um, the same simple algorithm. Um, so 7 to the power of y mod 11, 7 to the power of 4 mod 11, which gives 3. So what happens here is this value is sent to the receiver. So 5 is sent to the receiver. This value is sent to the sender, so 3 is sent to the sender. So then this new value, which is sent, replaces 7 in the algorithm. So it would be 3 to the power of x mod 11. So it would be 3 squared mod 11, which gives 9. So what the, set, um, what the receiver does with the sent value is it replaces 7 in the algorithm, just like the other one. And so it's 5 to the power of y mod 11, which gives 5 to the power of 4 mod 11, which gives 9. So as you can see, both of these uh, values are the same. So the sender and receiver have the same keys without having to actually send the keys. So here's how encryption algorithm works. You have a key and you have plain text. Using the key, you put the plain text and the key, that is, um, into the encryption algorithm. And then you get ciphertext which is the encrypted text, which needs to be decrypted in order for um, the data to be understood by the person or the hacker or whoever's um, getting it. So that's pretty much how it works. So asymmetric encryption is um, a little bit trickier to actually understand, um, as said. So this is how it works. So we'll, we'll go slow. We'll, um, we'll yeah, we'll, we'll just try to understand this. So asymmetric encryption is a more secure encryption method. It uses a private key and a public key when data is transmitted. And this is how it works. So user A uses a symmetric key to encrypt the message. The symmetric key itself is then encrypted using the public key, which is known to both users A and B. User A sends the message um, to user B over the internet. User B decrypts the symmetric key by using their own private key. The decrypted symmetric key is the, then used to decrypt the message sent. Now, this is a bit like, you, you might read this and say, what? What, 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 what? What is this? Well, that's the tricky part. The thing is, the public key is shared with both users A and B. User A has a public key, and user B has a public key. So what happens is user A um, encrypts the, um, the symmetric key using the public key. So basically, 
B's public key, so that when it's sent, once it's encrypted with B's public key, B can use its private key, which is known to only itself, to decrypt it. To better see this example, let's take a look at this. So this is a line. Um, this is meant to be uh, sort of the barrier between A and B. So we have user A and user B. So user A has a private key, only known to itself, and user B has a public key, known to both of both A and B. And B has the same thing, a private key to itself, and a public key shared between the two. So this is what happens. So A wants to send um, a text message to B. So there's a plain text and a symmetric key. What happens is it goes through an encryption algorithm and so on, and ciphertext is produced. What happens then is the ciphertext gets sent, um, but also the symmetric key gets encrypted by using public key B. Um, so I know I should have done this, but uh, you know I just wanted to make it clear that um, symmetric key is encrypted by the key known to both A and B to produce the encrypted key, which is, uh, did, I, did I do something here? Um, yeah, I did. Let me just go back here. Sorry about that. Um, it's the encrypted key, which is uh, sent to B. So ciphertext and encrypted key are sent to B. So what does B do now? This is what B does. The encrypted key that it gets sent, it has to decrypt it in order to decrypt the ciphertext. So it gets the encrypted key, decrypts it with the private key B, which um, is only known to B, so no one else can uh, decrypt it. Basically, the, the, the thing is, um, A can encrypt anything using B's public key, but can't decrypt it because it needs the private key to decrypt it. That's pretty much the idea of asymmetric encryption. Um, trust me, if this, is, if, if this seems hard to you, this isn't the hard part. The hard part is when hashing comes into it, and that's when uh, people are just like, uh, what is the difference between hashing and encryption? How, how does hashing work? How does that even make sense? Well, we'll try to go slow. Um, and actually, hashing is going to be covered in the next video, because um, hashing is more to do with authentication than encryption. But um, this video and the next video are um, linked, so you should probably um, watch this one and then the next one like right after. So then um, once it's decrypted, the um, symmetric key is, um, yeah, so this is symmetric key is, well, the encrypted key is decrypted and uh, that happens, <laughs> yeah, so it's decrypted pretty much. Then the ciphertext is decrypted using the symmetric key and then the plain text is produced. And that's pretty much how it works. Any confusion, just go back to whenever uh, I started this. Or look online. Either way, it's fine. So to increase security, the encryption keys are often generated by a hashing algorithm. Oh, here's the hard part. A hashing algorithm is different to an encryption algorithm. Uh, did I just say algorith <laughs> algorithm? A hashing algorithm takes a message or key and then translates it into a string of characters, which are almost impossible to break. Now, here's the thing. You can't dehash a hashed, um, well, yeah, a hashed, hashed data. You can't, like, simply dehash it somehow. It's like, you, once you hash it, it's done. So you might be wondering, oh, what's the point of doing this? Well, again, it's going to be covered in the next video, but um, and then we'll see how it increases security as well. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. IGCSE Computer Science, Syllabus Statement 1.4e, Show Understanding of the Use of Authentication. So in the last video, we looked at um, hashing in um, encryption. So we looked at how hashing could um, increase the security but we didn't really um, go into that. So this video, we're going to go into that, and then we're going to move on to methods of authentication. So again, the reason why I decided to put hashing here is because um, this um, is linked to one of the authentication methods, which is um, digital signatures. And also, it's, it's, it's used for verification. So it's used to verify data um, because a hash can't be 
a reverse to get the original message. So um, this is why it's kind of authentication. It's um, sort of follows that path. It's not really like encryption, but encryption does um, use it if need be. Um, so like an example would be um, a password is stored on a database, but as a hash. So um, the user enters their password um, to log in and the password is then hashed, sent to the um, wherever it gets sent and then um, is um, compared with the stored hash. Actually, it would get sent to the um, server or whatever it's the, the website. Um, and if they match, access is granted. If they don't, access is denied. So why can't hash be reversed? Like, why, why, why is that? Why, how does that work? Well, let's, let's put it this way. Say the hashing algorithm was um, x times y. x um, and y are numbers. So say x equals 5 and y equals um, 10. So it would be x times y, so 5 times 10, which gives us 50. So the 50 is the um, hashed value, and it's sent to wherever. Now, here's the thing. How would the algorithm know what produced that 50? Like, it could be 5 times 10. So it could be um, x could be 5, y could be 10. Or it could be something else, such as um, 25 and 2, which would also produce 50. So the algorithm wouldn't know what um, would be produced. So with that said, you can kind of see how um, hashing can't be reversed, as um, it's really hard to get the um, other, well, the, it's, it's basically, it's easier to go forward than backwards. Um, and there's also one more thing I was going to say, um, but I can't really remember what it was. Um, it was something like, oh, all right, yeah, I was going to say, um, like that algorithm, the x times y algorithm, is pretty basic. Now, keep in mind that hashing algorithms are a lot more complex than that. And x and y wouldn't be really small numbers, like 5 and 10. It would be pretty big numbers, right? So it's all of that, taking all of that into account, and the value would be much larger, the hash value would be much larger, which makes it even harder to get the original values. So you can kind of see why hashing is a forwards process and not a backwards process. So that's why it's used um, for verification and not encryption. So let's look at some hashing algorithms. Like take the MD4 hashing algorithm and then it will produce this. So if we input hello, it would produce this. If we input hello world, it would produce this. As you can see, there's a huge difference um, in the um, values. And all we did was add a space and world. If you tried to find um, an MD4 hashing algorithm online, and you um, input hello, but with a capital H, you'd notice um, sort of a similar difference. Like, it, the difference would be pretty big. There's also the MD5 hashing algorithm, but this is just to show you, like, the point. Like, is, the point is, Hashing is a really complex process. But if you notice, all the hashes have 32 characters. And this makes them 128 bits long. Strings that are 128 bits long give 3 times 10 to the power of 38 possible combinations, making them very secure. Some newer systems use strings that are 256 bits long giving 1 times 10 to the power of 77 possible combinations. So what does the what do these have to do with what do these have to do with anything? Now, here's the thing. If you think back um, to what we learned um, to, what, to what we learned in the last video about um, hashing being applied to encryption, you notice that we, we, we did talk about how um, the encryption keys are often generated by using a hashing algorithm. Algorithm, algorithm, algorithm. Um, so what, th what, what this basically means is um, with, yeah, with, with um, larger bits, there are more possible combinations. So the larger the key size, the more secure the encryption will be, the more possible combinations. So let's look at digital signatures. So 
Um, this system is based on public key encryption. That's um, asymmetric encryption. It's used to validate the aut authenticity of a message or electronic document. And it's kind of like reverse asymmetric encryption, but also makes use of hashing. Now, it's kind of, you might be thinking, wait, hang on, what? Um, reverse asymmetric encryption? Well, you, you'll see. So user A writes a message. The message is put through a hashing algorithm. And also keep in mind that um, this is authentication. So although there is encryption involved in this, um, that's not really the main point. So private key encrypts the hash. So this is the um, digital sign signature. It's then sent along with the message, so the encrypted hash and the original message, which hasn't been encrypted or hashed. Um, they're both sent to user B. User B then decrypts the hash using a public key and then uses this um, decrypted hash and um, in basically compares it with the message by um, hashing the message as well. Um, and it basically checks if data has been altered. Now, hang on, what's the point of doing this? Well, and, and how, how does it reverse asymmetric encryption? Well, let's, let's address that first. It's reverse asymmetric encryption because we see that a private key encrypts the hash here, and a public key is used to decrypt it. When we learned about asymmetric encryption in the last video, a public key encrypted the hash, and a private key or well, not the hash, but like the message, but um, you get the other point. A public key was used to encrypt, and um, a private key was used to decrypt. Here, it's the other way around. Private is used to encrypt, and public is used to decrypt. So what's the point of doing that? Wouldn't that mean that um, like anyone could decrypt the uh, hash? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that, well, yes. But the whole point of this is verification. So. Um, this basically checks if um, the person sending the message is legit. The person is like actually, you know, is he's authentic. they are authentic. That's pretty much the point. If you're confused by any of this, um, I suggest you go online because um, I, I looked at some good um, sources of information. And so if I'm not explaining clearly enough, just, uh, just go online. Because um, this is quite this is quite a um, complicated topic to understand, but when, once you understand, you can sort of get the idea. Anyway, let's look at something easier. So let's look at passwords. So um, everyone knows what a password is. So passwords, along with usernames, um, are used to log on, um, log in or log on to many systems. So like you could take Facebook for example. Um, yeah. So when a user logs into a system, both their username and password are entered and are checked against um, the stored username and password on um, the database to make sure that the person logging in is um, who they claim to be. If they both, if they, if they both match, um, access is granted. If they don't, access is, of course, denied. Um, and as said, passwords stored on the database can also be hashed to increase security. So um, the password sent when the user logs on is hashed and then checked against the stored password. Um, so this is, like, yeah, this, in, um, this increases security because A, the password sent is hashed. So if a hacker intercepts it, they won't be able to make any sense of it. And B, because the password in the database is also hashed, then there's no way, like, you know, if someone saw the passwords, there's no way anyone could, um, you know, dehash it or anything. Um, also, another point which is um, really good to make is um, it's important that um, hashes don't collide. What that basically means is hashes, like each value which is hashed, has to be unique. So um, take the word um, Shrek. So if Shrek is hashed, it may produce a certain um, hexadecimal value. And then take the word, um, let's see, what other movies do I have? Um, okay, take the word Battlefront. So Battlefront will have to have um, a different hash value than Shrek. If they collide, so basically if Shrek is hashed and um, Battlefront is hashed, and they have the same hash value, because, of course, um, there's no way 
the uh, there's no way that you could dehash something, then that kind of poses a problem, and you can kind of see why. So it's important that um, all of these are unique. Um, I don't know if you get what I'm saying, but um, no need to worry about it though, because uh, it's not really important. As long as you know um, that hashing is a forwards process, then uh, yeah. So biometrics. So this is the last um, authentication method we have to look at. And this type of authentication method um, uses physical qualities of humans. So this could include um, fingerprint scanners, retina scanners, facial recognition, and voice recognition. Now, here's the thing. We're only going to look at fingerprint scanners and retina scanners in this video because we looked at facial recognition and voice recognition um, in input devices. And that basically describes how they are used. Uh, so if you want to go there and uh, check them out, you can go ahead and do that. So we'll just move on to um, fingerprint scanners and retina scanners. So the user is asked to place or swipe their finger on a sensor. The image of their fingerprint is then compared with a stored, stored image of their fingerprint. And this is done by software looking at patterns of ridges and valleys. If they match, the user is granted access. And if they don't, of course, they're not granted access. In case you're wondering what ridges and valleys are, these are ridges, those little things here. And valleys are those weird thingies here. Retina scanners are a little bit different, well, a lot different. Um, so the user is asked to sit still for 10 to 15 seconds while the scan takes place. The scanner uses infrared to scan the unique pattern of blood vessels at the back of um, the user's eye. Ew, weird. The image is compared with a stored image, and if they match, the user is granted access. But this method is more secure than fingerprint scanners, because no one has found a way to duplicate blood vessel patterns. Here's what that means. So you take this eye here, for example, look at these blood vessel patterns. Now this is pretty complicated to copy because you have to look at like all these little things and all that, and it's in the back of the eye. I mean, come on, That's, it's, it's really hard. So you can think like, we could see our fingerprint like right in front of us, but the blood vessels at the back of our eye, we can't really see those because, you know, because our we're seeing from this point and they're back here. So there's no way we can actually see them. So it's pretty hard. So um, that's the end of authentication. Um, so that's the end of all the hard stuff, that um, is all the confusing stuff that um, you have to cover. Because the next video is, I believe, going to be about, um, if I can remember off the top of my head, um, if this is 1.4e, then f should be I can't remember. Uh, um, well, anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll find out. Um, I think it's something to do with um, fishing and farming, um, as well as den denial of service attacks, but I'm not entirely sure. I think it should be. Um, but, yeah, thanks for watching. Um, and if you need any further assistance, um, Google is right in front of you. Well, not, maybe not right in front of you, but Google is available. IGCSE Computer Science. Syllabus Statement 1.4F, Show Understanding of the Need to Keep Online Systems Safe from Attacks. So when we think about attacks, what we mean, like what we're going to be looking at is phishing, farming, and um, DOS, as in denial of service, not the other DOS. Um, yeah. So let's look at phishing first. So. Um, we're kind of doing what we did with security aspects. Um, so we have a description, effects um, of the risk, and methods to avoid it. So, yeah, let's begin. So the attacker sends a legit-looking email with a link. So when the victim um, clicks the link, as, as in the attacker sends the email to the victim, uh, when the victim clicks the link, they are redirected to a fake website. Now what this fake, fake website does is if the victim falls for it, then the victim, like, the, the, the website could be, oh, this um, bank account has just opened up. Um, so, like, you know, you can in put, enter your details and whatever, and uh, we'll, we'll create you an account. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just enter your, your little credit card number here, and, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the um, like, the emails, like, the, 
use large companies, so like they use well-known banks, um, to try to um, convince the victim that the email is authentic. So it'll sort of copy the format of the, like a legit bank and say, oh, like this is, for example, uh, I can't think of, I can't think of a bank at the moment, but like this is, oh, this bank, um, this is legit, you know, we create an account with us, we'll, we'll provide this, we'll provide this, we'll, yeah, so if the victim falls for it, then, ugh, they're screwed. Um, uh, the effects of the risk is the attacker can gain personal information, obviously, it's like bank account details, credit card numbers, and this can lead to fraud or identity theft and loss of money. So methods to avoid it, <laughs> don't open emails from unknown sources, obviously, and um, also ISPs can uh, filter phishing emails. Um, then there's farming, which is kind of the same idea, but it's, it's the method's a bit different. So um, in farming, the attacker installs malicious code on the victim's hard drive um, or the web server, and the code will redirect them to a fake website without their knowledge. And of course, the website will try to trick the uh, victim, saying, "Oh, well, this is, you know, you know." Um, so yeah. The effects of the risk include the attacker gaining personal information, identity theft, methods to avoid it, be alert and look for clues that um, you're being um, redirected to another website. Obviously, because if you're being a re redirected to another website, yeah, then you'd be like, hmm, I didn't really, I didn't really, you know, weird, I didn't do this. Hang on, I didn't. Um, and then some anti-spyware software can identify and remove um, farming code as well, so that helps. Um, what the user can also do is, um, when they're on a website, they can see that um, padlock or the um, HTTPS, so they know it's secure. If they don't see it, then uh, it's not secure. Now, here's the thing. Um, some people may confuse phishing and farming, like the terms. Some people might say, oh, phishing is when the code is installed. Well. To avoid this, here's a good way to think about it. So you know what actual fishing is, like actual fishing, like you go to a lake and you fish for fish. Like farming, planting seeds on the ground and whatever, um, the crops and all that. Here's how, what you, how you can think of it. Fishing, you grab a fishing rod, right? Put some bait on it, um, cast it, and then the fish will try to, well, the fish may try to eat the bait. That's kind of like um, computer fishing. So the bait is kind of like the email, and the fish is kind of the victim. So the, um, the fish can decide whether or not to fall for the trap. Farming is kind of like actual farming. So farming, like actual farming, you're planting seeds in the ground. Farming here, in this instance, we're planting code on the computer. So that's a good way to um, think about fishing and farming, in case you get confused. Then there's um, DOS attacks. So a denial of service attack prevents users from accessing a part of a network. This is usually done temporarily, but can be very damaging. I just had a sudden realization. Technically, this is the last security video, um, because the next one, we're just applying it to real life scenarios. So technically, this is the last security video. Um, so yeah, it's been through quite a bit. Anyway. Um, so, one DOS attack method is um, flooding the network with useless traffic, and this is how it works. So when a user clicks on or enters a link, a request is sent to the internet server which contains the website. The server can only handle so many weird ways. Hang on, before we get to that, I should probably explain more about <laughs> the DOS attack, actually. Um, so just ignore that you saw all that. Um, anyway. Um, so what a denial of service attack can do is it can stop you from like accessing your email or accessing some particular websites or accessing like online services like sh like online shopping or online banking. Now we can move on to this. <laughs> okay, so um, one DOS attack method is flooding the network with useless traffic, and this is how it works. When a user clicks on or enters a link, a request is sent to the internet server which contains the website. The server can only handle so many requests. S requests. So if it's flooded with thousands of requests, it won't be able to service the user's legit request, therefore denying the user service. So yeah, the um, server becomes like, you know, there's all this stuff. It's like, whoa, we can't sort this out. Where does this go? Where does that go? Where does, we can't really sort this. So 
that's um, pretty much how it works. So the server can only handle so many requests. So yeah, that's how it works. So let's look at an example of this. So um, like a user's email account, for example, the attacker, what, he, what they do is they send many spam emails to the user's inbox. And ISPs only allow a certain amount of data for each user. So when the user's inbox gets filled with spam messages, the user won't be able to receive legit emails because, like, you know, there's a lot of spam and, the, the, like, the server can't handle that. So, therefore, they cannot, they, they're basically denied service. Get how that works now, hopefully. There are methods to avoid um, denial of service attacks as well. Um, so, use an up-to-date malware or virus checker. Um, although a virus is kind of malware. Okay. Um, use a firewall to restrict traffic to and from the user's computer and internet server. Use email filters to filter out um, spam email. Um, look out for slow performance when accessing websites because um, you can know, tell that something is going on. Like, it's quite a lot of um, stuff going on. Now, a DOS attack can be aimed at one victim or a few victims or many victims. Usually it's one, because some, some hacker wants to get at one person who um, they, like, you know, they just get really, they just don't like them. So they're just like, yeah, let's, let's deny you some service. Um, look out for unavailability or inability to access particular websites. So, like, if you can't access that or if this service isn't available or you're not, like, able to do this. And also look out for large amounts of spam emails in uh, your inbox, because obviously that's, um, yeah. IGCSE Computer Science. And this is the final statement from Topic 4, or 1.4, or uh, you just call it 4 because it is Topic 4 of Theory. Um, describe how knowledge of security can be applied um, to real-life scenarios. So it's really important for um, security to be applied to online banking and shopping. Now, this is for obvious reasons, because online banking, like hackers can hack your um, credit card numbers if they can intercept it being transmitted. So it's important for security to be applied here. And also shopping, because again, credit cards and stuff like that. So along with encryption, security protocols, and other security methods that we've looked at um, in the previous videos, these websites may carry out other procedures for... Um, extra security. So that's pretty much what we're going to look at. So a bank may use a 10 or 12 digit code um, unique to every customer. So each customer gets this code. The customer will be asked to enter it. So that's one, um, one thing that they could do. So for example, I've created this um, thing called the Liam and Scott Bank. That's um, me and that's Scott. And uh, we have a bank. Um, and we ask our customers to um, input their 12-digit codes the first thing that they do um, when they access our site, when they want to log in to their account. So we ask them to um, enter their 12-digit um, code. A bank may also ask a user to input um, the numbers from their four-digit PIN um, and or, or other characters from their password. Um, now. Now we know that most, like when we go to ATMs, we input our PIN. Oh, well, actually, I don't do that because I don't have a credit card. But um, most people do that. But what bank, like online banks, can actually do is ask you for specific numbers from the PIN. For example, um, enter digit two from your PIN. Enter digit four. Enter digit three. So it's like that. So um, so we like Scott and I. We ask our customers to input. Um, some characters from their pin, and um, the, like the character that they have to enter is randomized to increase security. Some systems may also use a handheld device in which the user inserts their credit card. We usually see these in restaurants. Um, so like when you, or yeah, yeah, restaurants. So like when you're um, paying for your food and you want to pay with credit card, um, the waiter or waitress comes in with the uh, one of those um, machines. You put your credit card in. Uh, pin is input. So they, um, they enter their pin and the device will then generate a code which the user must type in on the website. The code is generated from an internal clock and um, the pin. 
the bank servers, the bank's server, and the time are all um, are synchronized with the handheld device, and uh, of course the bank's server also stores the pin. So the bank server will know if the code is entered correctly on the website. So that's yeah, quite a cool thing. They, um, banks may also ask the user to enter parts of their passwords using drop-down boxes, and this is to help prevent spyware software, because um, this forces a mouse to be used. Um, so the use of the keyboard is eliminated because spyware software like key loggers, um, they sense keys um, input from the keyboard. If you use a mouse, you know, that's avoided. And um, just um, one more thing, back to that um, pin slash character thing, enter the digits from the pin, that also helps avoid spyware software. Because um, if you input your pin, like if your pin is 1234, and you um, input 1234, Spyware software is going to see under log 1234 pressed by the user. But if it's uh, random characters from the pin, then um, it could be like 2143, or, um, or if it's three characters, then 213, then you know, the, the, the key logger is going to see 213. And that's going to be like, um, OK, let's try that. No, no, that didn't work. Clearly, something's going on. So security. So um, Scott and I ask our um, customers to enter their, the characters from their um, password using drop-down boxes so that they don't have to use the keyboard so that um, spyware software can get the key presses. Um, after all this, banks may ask for some personal information, such as your last login date or your pet's name. And we can see this usually when we, um, if you've ever um, forgotten your password on, say, Gmail, and they ask you a security question that you set when you created the account, such as what is your mother's maiden name, or um, what was the, your first teacher's name, something like that. Um, then the user must answer that in order to get their account. The same thing applies here. It's just extra security. And this, of course, um, is personal, so um, hackers shouldn't be able to answer it. Um, finally, the user will be sent to the website homepage. And it may be important to only use the links or buttons the bank provides to navigate through the site. Now, if you use, like, for example, if you input, um, like, up, like on, on the URL box, um, a page from on the bank's website, they might say, oh, error, you must log in again, because um, something's went wrong, and you can't do that. Also, if you press the forward or backwards arrow on your browser, that might also cause the same problem. So it's good that if you navigate through the bank's buttons, it's more secure. So, we've been through all of that. Let's um, use our knowledge from security to answer a past paper question. So I got this from the 2015 May-June exam. Um, I think from paper one. Like, as in, as in, yeah, yeah, pa yeah of, of course paper one, but like paper one one, I think it was. Um, anyway. So an online bank requires a client to supply an eight-digit code each time they wish to access their account on the bank's website. Rather than, asks, um, rather than ask the client to use a keyboard, they are requested to use an on-screen keypad shown on the right to input the eight-digit code. The position of the digits on the keypad can change each time the website is visited. The client uses a mouse or touchscreen to select each of the eight digits. So. Here's the thing. We, we have some information here, and we're meant to answer some questions here. So question one, explain why the bank has chosen to use this method of entering the eight digits. Now, if we go back, we can see that the client must um, use an on-screen keypad um, to input the code. And also, um, the positions of the keypad, on the keypad um, the pos positions of the digits on the keypad change, and also, they're required to use a mouse or touch screen to select them. Now here's the um, answer to the question. So digits on the keypad are mixed up, which makes the combination more difficult to interpret. And also using a mouse or touch screen defeats spyware software, which um, picks up keyboard presses. So there's our answer. Question two, name and describe another, another one that the bank could in introduce to improve the security of their website. Now, if you remember what we just talked about just now, we could say, we could say um, a few things, more than a few things. We could say, 
have username input as well to um, help improve security. So they both must they both much uh, they both must match in order for access to be granted. Now, we haven't looked at that in this video, but we looked at that in the authentication video. We looked at usernames as well. So that could be one of our answers. We can also have um, personal information questions. So like, what is your pet's name? And um, you can also like include other things like, like include like have firewalls, have um, some kind of security protocol. Um, it's quite like mark schemes tend to be quite open to these types of um, questions. So like, you know, you, you say quite a, quite a bit. So uh, yeah, that's it. So that's the end of security, and we're finally on to the last topic of theory. We're finally on to ethics. And we are finished with theory, um, and we can move on to paper two. So yeah.